Hello, everybody, and welcome to this follow-up webinar of the benchmarking study and its repercussions from the Bike Share Expert Group of the CIE. We are, as some of you know, while people are joining in, the main expert group of the industry in Europe. Um, within the industry association cycling industries europe mostly advocating for uh bike and also bike share of course within the european union um just to give you a little insight as a group we have been collaborating in providing data and information to the european commission and one of the results that we have achieved as a group this year has been to introduce bike share in the European cycling declaration for the very first time as well. So this is one of the achievements of this group. Besides, we have also come up with position papers and the study that was uh, brilliantly created by the CIE, benchmarking 148 cities in Europe, um, not looking at the operator specifically, but actually looking at KPIs from the different cities and how they've been performing. We carried out a first webinar on the 26th of September, uh, basically explaining a little bit of the results and having some conversations about what the interest might have been and, and why one city was ranked above another in certain, uh, in certain categories. Um, and the turnout was so huge that we decided that we just needed another one, another session to come up with answers to all the questions that have been uh, coming in over the last few weeks. And that's why we're here today with the actual experts. We have uh, quite a big panel today. We're accompanied by Kevin Main, who's the CEO of Cycling Industries Europe. Sébastien Marteau, Chief Commercial Officer of Fluctuo. José Sabarin, Product Manager at Shared Mobility Data. Giancarlo Crivello, Client Relationship Officer, PBSC. Mareike Rauchhaus, Head of Communications and Public Policy, Tier by Nextbike. Sebastian Schlebusch, Head of Market Development at DOT. Jaron Bornstein, Co-Founder of Cargaroo. Alexander Fellrexen, co-founder of Dunkey Republic, and Caroline van Rendergem, Impact and Public Affairs Director at 15. So pretty much all the stakeholders of the industry we have managed to gather here today. So without further ado, we're going to get right at it. We have a format today of four blocks. We're going to talk about data in relationship to the study, market, it's going to be followed by a little bit of operations talk and we're going to finalize with investments and we're going to have a question for each one of the panelists and that might be followed up by by certain quick uh, amendments by anybody and we're going to finalize with some um, open floor q a at the very end if we have time for that so without further ado we're going to start with kevin main and uh, the question for you, Kevin, hello. Yeah, here. Yeah. Is, as the author of the study, could you tell us about the limitations of the study? Is the study focusing on publicly funded or also including private operations? And another question is, were you able to find the number of active operators for each city? Thanks. Um, for the kind of team doing the analysis, I guess you could describe it as being a bit like an onion in that you can peel back layers, but as you do, it gets smaller. So yes, we had the number of operators and the number of bikes for every city that we studied. When it then came to, for example, the number of trips, about half the cities make the data publicly available or flipped over were able to give us that data set. A bit more, we had partial data because some operators did and some operators didn't give content. And then when you get down to things like trip length, we only had about 20 operators providing where we get data. And it's very important to say in this study that we are not prepared to publish data operator level. It's, I mean, this is a highly commercial industry. It's very, very competitive. 
and people are also involved in public sector contracts and licensing. And so we were really talking about bike sharing in public policy and therefore where we could aggregate to at least a city level, say, for example, at least two operators was our strong preference. But the point of the question is, yes, it's there. And I would add more data could be there depending on the policies of some of those cities. And we would strongly encourage it so that future studies have a more comprehensive coverage. But uh, certainly, you know, operators and bikes and, you know, existence of bike share schemes, that was pretty universally available. Very good. Thank you, Kevin. Um, with that said, let's actually go into the first block of the webinar, which is uh, centered a little bit more on data. For that uh, category, we have both Jose and Sebastian Malto from Fluctuo. Um, I have the first question for Sebastian specifically. So Fluctuo was uh, the company that provided the data necessary for this study. And uh, a question would from the people that have been reading this, could you give us, Sebastian, a little more details as to how you collected the data? Researchers often only have access to a very limited number of data sets as some operators do not share them. How do you plan to tackle this and allow more in-depth research on bike sharing usage and user patterns? Thanks, Christian. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, so first, you know, like, uh, I mean, re regarding the, the data collection, so the, the data collection period for, for this uh, this analysis was done was done in uh, Q3 2022, uh, covering mainly July, August, September 2022. So it, it's a year old. And what we did is uh, we looked at really what were the key cities, you know, the, the key 148 cities in Europe including uh, the one rate, the climate neutral on smart cities that have an objective to be climate neutral by 20, 2030. And also the large, the largest um, uh, cities among the 424, what we call the 10 T urban nodes, you know, which are the trans-European tr uh, transport network uh, urban nodes. And what we've done for that is uh, as, um, as an aggregate of data on this market, we've been uh, working through a, a lot of different sources and I first you know like working of course through uh, the data sharing agreement we have with uh, with bike sharing operators uh, and we have uh, in the room today a lot of bike sharing operators that are sharing data because they understand that the the value of this uh, you know growing segments on very dynamic segment is to really be unified to fight you know the elephant in the room which is the car uh, ownership and the car usage in uh, in cities on, uh, on the, its impact on the overall uh, decarbonation of uh, urban mobility. So what we've done is, uh, yeah, we really collected, uh, you know, first uh, fleets uh, available beyond differentiating station based on free floating bikes. We see that uh, now there are really different uh, type of, uh, you know, market segment on both. Uh, and then, you know, in terms of data, you will see, I mean, from, uh, from Jose Sabourin from uh, Mobility Data, there is, uh, a unified standard, which is called uh, GBFS. So that's that's a prime source of uh, information. There are also um, uh, some data available as uh, uh, MDS, you know, which is a data that is shared with uh, with city. And what we can see is that when uh, bike sharing operators are really unified and work together, there is a lot more insights that we can get in terms of uh, the trip duration, the trip distance, uh, in terms of uh, uh, the multimodal dimension, you know, of, uh, of the, the, the bike movement across cities. Um, uh, we can see that in, uh, yeah, there are also in the future, we could look at uh, yeah, what is the cost for inhabitants and what are the benefits for inhabitants of, uh, of bike sharing. So uh, I, I think what is crucial to understand, and we, I would say we are fortunate on bike sharing is uh, there is a lot of open data uh, on a lot of open data repository, but it's really important to continue sharing this data to really make the, the data accessible, not only for uh, city authorities, for public transport operators, but for the entire industry, because it will benefit the entire society. And that's why, you know, we organize this type of uh, webinar on really raising awareness on, uh, on bike sharing. Yeah, thank you, Sebastian. I think you guys seem to look to doing an excellent job at aggregating uh, the data and, and making it possible to have studies like these that the bike share expert group is bringing out to the public and the cities. So speaking of what you were mentioning, Sebastian, 
publicly available data, uh, it's kind of obvious that we'll have to talk with mobility data now and Jose, the representative, uh, you guys have been creating GBFS for a while. For those of you who don't know it, maybe you can give a brief intro about it, but I'll also ask you the question that has come in, which is that uh, pricing has been quite uh, something that uh, people were missing from this study. And CIE could obviously not address this issue uh, as it would breach some com commercial confidentiality. And the data is also not easily ac accessible, but is there any way that GBFS could help us understanding costs and potentially aggregating cost data and revenue data? Is the information as available for cycling than it is for public transport? Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, so for a very quick 10 second, what is GBFS? Um, GBFS is a real-time data format that shows uh, riders the availability of a system at any given time um, with every, whatever trip planning app you'd like to use. You can open it up and see what uh, bikes or scooters or shared cars are available uh, around you. Um, I see multiple layers to this question. Um, if we're talking about pricing um, and simply the cost to rent a vehicle, that is something that's able to be represented in GBFS and you can, you can access that information as easily as you could access it on, on the operator's website. Uh, but if we're talking about operating costs and revenue, that's not necessarily something that you'd be able to find in GBFS. Uh, as I mentioned, it's rider facing information and it's all real time. Uh, so if you wanted to, you know, you could hypothetically be archiving snapshots of GBFS data sets, but that's not going to give you any insight into cost or revenue. Uh, if you wanted stuff, uh, information about cost or revenue, you might be able to get that through MDS, but not as, um, I think, explicitly as this person is asking for. Uh, and there isn't really a standard that exists for this yet because it's very highly individualized from operator to operator. And even, you know, we mentioned it in the question alone that it's, it's very sensitive when we talk about revenue uh, information. Uh, and then the next layer is, I thought this was interesting, it says, is the information as available for cycling than for public transport? And I won't get on my soapbox too much, but I think that'll only be possible once we start seeing bike share as public transport and start integrating it into our public transport systems. Uh, but that's a whole webinar that we could have on that. And so I won't get into it too, in too much detail, but the, the short of it is, is no, that information is not available uh, in the same way that it is for public transport since it is highly privatized sector. Uh, we're seeing it come out a little bit more and more with systems that are more uh, public private partnerships or starting to even go more just completely public. Uh, but uh, for the time being, the answer is no, we cannot do that in GBFS, but maybe one day we will all uh, have bike share that's integrated with public transport and the information will be super easy and accessible. Very true. Thank you, Yossi, for the insight. You have just given us an idea for the next webinar. So here we go. Uh, I would like to remind as we're scrolling through the blocks to the other panelists that you're most welcome to uh, come in and, and have a, an addition if you want to do that. There's also for the audience here, there's the chat box. So you can go in there and ask some questions directly as well to the panelists here. Uh, it's quite a luxury to have them all gathered here. So do take the opportunity for it. All right, moving on to block market. Uh, PBSC is probably one of the uh, largest uh, bike share suppliers worldwide. So we have received um, some questions <laughs> as to how to promote bike share in cities where there's a low cycling modal share, something that uh, showed up in the majority of the cities, even in the European study. Uh, limited cycling infrastructure as well as limited cycling culture. As PBSC has a global presence, notably in South America, North America, as well as in Europe, Giancarlo, could you guide us as to what are some strategies to promote bike share in such cities? And do you think e-bikes can make a difference to boost bike share in those cities? All right, uh, thank you for the question. I get uh, asked this uh, question uh, many times from many cities, so very valid question. Uh, firstly, let me say that what works in one city doesn't necessarily mean it will work for your city. Um, so that being said, so my first learning I can share from other successful cities is 
get involved. You need to be engaged. You need to listen uh, by have, you know, for example, by having community outreach sessions, uh, you will understand why your citizens are hesitant to get on, on a bike. Uh, and most importantly, how to address them. Uh, for example, I, I've seen many cities have uh, bike safety courses on weekends, uh, you know, not only for adults, but for children uh, too, to, to engage, to get that bike culture uh, started at a very young age. So it's very, it's, you know, it's beyond bike share. It's how to get, you know, butts on, uh, on seats, on bikes. Um, planning sessions, uh, have planning sessions to understand where the needs and the demand is so you can address them, you know, putting a bike lane infrastructure. Uh, if it's a bike share system you want by having it uh, serviced. So you need uh, to be engaged. Uh, second question on uh, E-bikes, absolutely, uh, you know, in our perspective, it's a game changer. Uh, you know, just, you know, five, six years ago, you know, very rare to have a bike uh, share system with e-bikes. Uh, today, it, it's common. In, in North America, we're seeing cities with three, four X uh, more rides now on e-bikes than versus a mechanical bike. Uh, in South America, uh, we're seeing e-bikes cutting journey times by 66% compared to cars. Uh, you know, at PVSC, uh, now majority of our daily rides are on e-bikes versus mechanical bikes. So definitely, uh, in, in, you know, my view, it's been a game changer. And maybe I can sum up both questions in one example. Uh, Dubai, um, no real cycling infrastructure and, and cycling culture. Uh, but what they did have is a, a local stakeholders that were involved and we're engaged. Uh, where is Dubai today? Uh, the local government has announced uh, close to 900 kilometers of bike lanes before 2026, whereas the majority are already uh, on the ground. And, and since the launch of the bike sharing system, approximately over 5 million rides have been taken on bikes. So I, I guess the message here is, uh, you know, yes, it's not easy, but it could be done with you know proper investment and time. Thank you, Giancarlo. Very interesting uh, examples that you put out there. It's not always the most obvious markets that are doing the best. Uh, we'll get back to more about e-bikes uh, in the next blocks and questions as well. Um, but just to continue a little bit with what to do in mid to smaller size cities. Um, the other large uh, supplier and also operator of bike share systems in Europe is uh, arguably Nextbike, represented here by Mareike. Uh, so Mareike, the question for you, following up a little bit on what we asked Giancarlo, you're present in small and mid-sized cities and a lot of them, notably also in Eastern Europe, what factors would attract bike sharing companies to cities with populations under 100,000 residents and how can multimodality be supported in those cities? Seems that I'm the German small town girl here, no. But uh, by the way, we mostly operate in a city over cities over 100,000 uh, inhabitants, uh, for example, Berlin, or I saw Peter in the chat in Budapest, um, but seriously, uh, regarding smaller cities or rural areas, uh, we have best practices like Karlsruhe or Mannheim, which were top ranked in the benchmark study in terms of rental per bikes per day. I remember Karlsruhe was on number two and Mannheim was on number four. So let's discuss what's the secret of success. So both cities are mid-sized cities. They are traffic hubs of metropolitan areas and uh, the central cities of uh, two of our regional bike sharing systems. Um, Karlsruhe is KVV next bike, which embraces seven cities in total. And uh, Mannheim is part of VIN next bike, which embraces 21 cities in total. Um, 
One secret is both are operated by Nextbike, of course, and uh, on behalf of the regional public transport organization. And both are subsidized by the cities and the PDOs. So these, uh, these, these schemes have in, in common that uh, they are fully public, public transport integrated, uh, which means free rides for subscribers, uh, mobility as a service application, availability near stations and beyond. They are branded in the corporate design of the PTO. KVV next bike is red, VN next bike is blue, like the tram or the buses. And last but not least, we have a marketing budget, which is really important um, there. And, but we have, to, to face that behind this success uh, in rural areas or in smaller towns, uh, the demand is more or less than in urban city centers. So there the car seems still more comfortable and reliable. And um, But Mannheim and Karlsruhe, for example, have a very well developed public transport system in their metropolitan areas. Um, so there you can ride with the next bike to the station, jump on a train, rent again a next bike when you have arrived. And there the bikes are the individual complement uh, for shorter distances in one of the cities, a complement of the public transport. So it's perfect for commuters and you all know uh, these are mostly the, the cause of the traffic uh, jams uh, during the rush hour. So what's the conclusion? Um, bike sharing in, in general has to be funded as a sustainable public service, as a part of a strong and well-developed public service and uh, public transport. And um, if we compare the implementation of a public bike sharing scheme and the investment, we have so much lower investment there than with other uh, public transport modes. So let's do it. And you already mentioned Christian and, and Giancarlo, it's difficult to establish bike sharing, but we do this since uh, PBSC and also we and, uh, all the others colleagues we do this since over 10 years and it's working so the solutions are already there let's do it very very powerful statements to finalize your examples i also think to be honest yes it's true the the metropolitan systems that next bike have are just a uh, real an example for the industry and has brought a lot of people from rural areas to bike share uh, so they are an example to to check out. Absolutely. There we go. Representing Marika. All right, let's jump back to the e-bike question. Um, we have Sebastian Schlebusch, who's representing DOT. Um, and for you, we have the question, in your experience, is it that electric bike share can be financially viable? And if a city would like to start today with a bike share scheme, would you advise to make it a 100% electric bike fleet, just pedal bikes or a combination and why? Sebastian. Yes, thank you for the questions. Towards the first question, so DOT has invested into unsubsidized e-bike schemes two years ago. Currently, <clears throat> excuse me, currently we operate around about 15,000 e-bikes in 14 cities from 50 to 7,000 bikes in a city. We typically operate them in combination with e-scooters, so leveraging operational synergies and scale effects, and thus making the operations profitable. That said, I don't want to send the message here that bike share can or should generally sustain itself without any further public investments. I'm fully with Marijk and others here uh, that profitable operations are mostly limited in their impact. Yes, we can operate profitably in certain conditions and in certain geographies, uh, like in highly dense city centers at market rates where uh, which might not be affordable for everyone and yeah with certain set of appropriate local regulations so not too many different operators appropriate fleet sizes limited operational constraints etc but if you want your bike share 
scheme, whether it's private or public or a combination of both, to maximize its potential impact to the society, like the expansion into suburbs where alternative modes of transport are much needed, you know, like affordable fees for everyone, you should really consider continuous monetary support of your local operators. Um, the second question, so whether I should, would advise on a 100% electric bike fleet or not. Um, so we have a com as a company have made a decision three years ago uh, to focus, uh, five years ago actually, to focus on electrically assisted vehicles, so e-bikes and e-scooters only. So from a company philosophy, I would have to advise, yes, 100% electric. Yeah? So what I give you a few arguments to support this philosophy, but I appreciate that there might be different views here in the room and I'll let you comment as well if you like. So why 100% electric? Lots of product innovation of the recent years has gone into e-bike products, making them today's users and operators choice. Um, Giancarlo mentioned three, four times more rides uh, on average than pedal bikes in some of his cities. And we, uh, yeah, we see this trend. Then in markets with both e-bikes and pedal bikes, E-bikes typically yeah, outperform pedal bikes in terms of usage per vehicle per day. That's basically a similar um, statement. But the market has shown that e-bikes generate higher average revenues per ride as well. So outweighing higher variable costs, outweighing also upfront investment for e-bikes, which are a bit higher uh, than for, with pedal bikes. But that means on the bottom line, the unit economics of e-bikes are not worse than pedal bikes. Hence. If your objective is to maximize your number of bike share rights, maximize your mode shift potential at a reasonable cost to the taxpayer, yeah, your solution has to be 100% electric bikes, right? But your objectives might be different. Yeah? You might receive your budget from public health grants. You want to maximize the health benefits pedal bikes might provide. Although I would argue that the longer average distances with e-bikes also outweigh these perceived benefits of pedal bikes. It's a hypothesis. I don't have any data to support it. Maybe someone here in the room can share some research about this in the chat. I'd be really interested in it. And yeah, also for towards the uh, operators with mixed pedal bike, e-bike experience, such as Donkey, such as Nextbike, PVC, you might have an, opportunity, an opinion to share as well on this question. Alex, Caroline. Yeah, hello. Can you all hear me? I'm Alex from Dunk Republic. I think really good point from Sebastian, a good colleague in the industry. Um, of course, Dunk Republic operates both electric bikes and, and regular bikes. And uh, what we see is there seems to be quite a good use case for regular bikes. You can see, especially if, and I think it's a good point as Sebastian brings up, what do you want with your system, right? So if you have trips that are maybe below five kilometers, that's the average trip your, your riders are taking, regular bikes, are very good for that distance. It also depends a lot on the infrastructure, I think, in the city and, and other elements. We do have cities where we operate regular bikes, where we have more trips per bike than the e-bike operations in the same cities. So I think it is, as it is with this industry, it is kind of a bit different from city to city where, where you need one thing or the other. So in general, we are quite big fans of mixing the fleets between electric bikes and regular bikes. Um, this means you can kind of have bikes that cover some user types and some user types of trips and maybe e-bikes are better for longer trips. Well, I think they definitely are. And I think we do see a lot of demand in the market for regular bikes. And I think that normally comes when we talk to um, organizations and cities and so on from uh, wanting to push active mobility as a point can be one that's brought up. Another one is cost efficiency where you have regular bikes being less less things that can go wrong uh, and, and a bit more robust uh, element and a lower cost to, to buy. And another one can be a sustainability, sustainability impact because you kind of consider what goes into producing batteries and electricity and charging and all these different points. Uh, so I definitely think both uh, vehicle types have a good place and a good role to play in the, in the good city, the livable city. So do you think, Alex, and also follow up for Sebastian that in five years time, mechanical bikes will still play a significant role in bike share? I think definitely there'll still uh, be quite a lot of mechanical bikes around in five years. I do see uh, a lot of e-bike demand coming up. So I think that will continue to happen and grow. Uh, so if it's gonna be you know, a 50-50 or maybe even 70% electric bikes, but I think there will be a lot of mechanical bikes around in five years. Sebastian, your take? Who am I to challenge that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think the, 
uh, the share of electric bikes tends to grow bigger and bigger over time. But yeah, I do see arguments uh, as Alex has proposed uh, are valid as well. It depends a bit on the local circumstances for sure and the local cycling culture. Very good, very diplomatic. So let's move on to um, Jerun. Jerun I, is- If I can uh, just react. Sorry. Yes, please do react. Uh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to um, to to uh, I'm Caroline from from 15. We we provide uh, bikes in about uh, 30 cities in the world, and we have a big experience of a mixed fleet in Paris. Um, uh, Smoothengo our partner is operating, and just to to react on that uh, um, uh, topic about e-bikes. Um, we, we, we agree uh, and we experience that e-bikes are able to provide longer trips uh, so then you can operate wider uh, zone but um, we often see uh, cities still uh, tendering with a mixed fleet and um, we tend to uh, uh, discourage uh, cities to do that because it makes operation much uh, more complicated than 100% uh, pedal bike or 100% e-bike just because, well, people tend to prefer uh, e-bike. And uh, the an example that we had is that when we pass in Paris from a, um, a mechanical fleet to a 40% uh, e-bike uh, fleet, then uh, we had um, an increase of uh, three times uh, the number of uh, young people using e-bikes. So, uh, the, also, sometimes we have in mind that e-bikes are for older people. It's not the case. Uh, young people prefer e-bike because it doesn't make you sweat, um, for, probably. <laughs> uh, and um, and also we have a um, um, uh, a very um, di a big difference uh, in usage between. So apart from being more complicated to reparate, we also have. Um, that also caused by the fact that we have much more trips uh, with e-bike than than pedal bike. So it, it makes a fleet that is very um, uh, not um, not equal, and uh, that's why we, we we tend to think, even though it is uh, it is uh, sometimes uh, um, a matter of price for cities to invest in e-bikes at the beginning, but then uh, the return on investment in terms of trips. So probably in terms of revenue, as we were also uh, talking about profitability, will make a big difference because the usage will be much uh, much higher with a 100% electric fleet. Very good. Thank you, Carolyn. We'll get back to you in a second also to talk more about investments and financing of bikeshare systems. I appreciate the, the intervention. But going from e-bikes to a specific kind of bike cargo bikes, Jeroen, um, Cargaroo has been an innovator in this industry for the scale of your cargo bike systems. Um, what would you say are your measures that you're taking to reach new target groups and to make cargo bike sharing more inclusive? Hi, Christian. Um, maybe good to tell uh, people in the call what we exactly do. Uh, so we are in a special part of this market. Uh, we uh, rent out shared electric cargo bikes. We work uh, electric only. That's also to make it more accessible to people. Uh, those bikes are mainly used uh, by families, like 70% use them. Uh, it's family use where the uh, customers use the bike to go with their kids to places, sports clubs, etc. When we start in a city where there's some cycling culture, then you see that those families are the obvious early adopters. We don't need to tell them they come automatically, um, but cargo bikes are expensive. Usually we cannot do without subsidy from the city, only in the very large and dense cities in uh, like Amsterdam or Utrecht, where there's already a large adoption. Uh, so we try to find additional target groups uh, to uh, make, uh, make a better business case. And that's why we usually don't advertise for the family use, because that goes by itself. We advertise for other use. So our home marketing is, for example, uh, focused on uh, business use, uh, used by students. Uh, there are families uh, without kids that use cargo bikes to do their shoppings. Uh, they transport goods. Uh, they buy something on eBay, and they get that uh, by using a cargo bike. Um, 
important to realize that cargo bikes are uh, the critical ingredient to be able to to uh, let go of your car because uh, for individual transport there's normal bikes there's uh, mopeds there's kick scooters uh, but if you have uh, uh, kits to transport or, or stuff to transport all those uh, modes don't work so you, you need something like a cargo bike and that's why cities really appreciate what we do uh, so what we do is uh, we target specific groups like what we see um, uh, when we are longer in a city you see that additional groups start to discover the, the cargo bike for example you see uh, couples using the bike where one one person is sitting in front one person is cycling it's kind of a social event uh, for couples, you see lots of students doing the same, uh, getting their uh, crates of beer or their stuff. Uh, and you see uh, uh, like a ser small service uh, individuals uh, like uh, uh, flower shops, uh, uh, coffee companies, um, uh, service technicians. They use the bike for, uh, yeah, for their kind of logistics where they go with their stuff to their customers. Um, maybe also I, it's good to to tell you of some things we do to get people over their hurdle because not everyone is uh, is safe to to cycle on a cargo bike or feel safe to cycle on a cargo bike because it looks like a big thing um, in practice if you try it for like 10 minutes you will usually find out that it's not so difficult it's quite doable but you need to get people to try it and to, to do that first 10 minutes. So what we, do, what we do is we organize clinics in cities where we operate. Uh, we invite people to come to, to some square where there's many people. Um, and we help people to, to do their first round of five minute cycling. Uh, and usually that works. Um, that, yeah, that gets people over their first fear of a cargo bike is not a, a scary thing. Um, Second thing we do is we create ambassadors in cities. So we uh, we we try to attract the first group of early adopters that already have experience with cargo bikes, and we give them some free credits and tell them please show it to your friends uh, and to other people you know. Uh, and the main um, message here is seeing people cycle makes other people cycle. Uh, so our main uh, mode of advertisement is is our own bikes. Uh, when people see them cycling around, they think, "Hey, this is also uh, something that apparently is possible." So let's let's try it. So that's the main outtake. Um, and additionally, we do some things for for social groups which are really not accustomed to biking or cargo bikes. Uh, we did some examples in Amsterdam where we we had a group of uh, of uh, people with a migrant background who uh, could actually not cycle and we organized a cycle course. And then uh, in around five lessons, we were able to have those people uh, cycle on a cargo bike with no prior experience on cycling. And they were extremely happy because their, their range of operation increased a lot. So there was lots of mothers from a migrant background who previously could only go around by walking and now they could go much further and take their kids and take stuff. So they were very happy about that. But that is something that we can do on a very small scale because obviously that costs money, but that's something that I would every advise every city to uh, subsidize that kind of activity and that kind of marketing. Exactly. Not just the operators doing the, the job that you have set an example for, Jeroen, but yeah, as Giancarlo also mentioned earlier, education, education, education by the cities as well. Thank you, Jeroen. We get back to you, Alexander. Um, we know that Donkey Republic has been a champion of uh, carrying out uh, research and actually showing evidence of how you're changing uh, the model shift and leading it. Uh, the question from the public is, are you able to identify the greenhouse gas emission savings associated to a modal shift from automobile to bike sharing or other beneficial outcomes? And a second question is, were you able to prove your customers shifted from an automotive mode of transportation towards bike sharing? Okay, uh, thank you for that question. Yes, and I'm Alex from Dunker Public. We have about 20,000 regular bikes and e-bikes together in, in Europe. 
And that this is a great question. I, I mean, impact measurement has been close to my heart for a long time, in also before Donkey and other uh, element, other partners in Donkey Republic. Um, and we have indeed done some really good structures on this. Uh, I think what's important to note when it comes to measuring non-financial outcomes uh, and impact uh, when companies do that, not just in our industry, that all data shared is not equal. It's important to be kind of robust and, and, and disciplined in how you do this if you want to come out with something that's uh, correct and not misleading. Um, but we have been able to do a replacement study where uh, and where we looked at greenhouse gas emissions and other social benefits. Um, we've done this by collaborating with OECD research papers, COVI engineers at the Transport Ministry of Denmark and, and Eurostats uh, research papers they published. So we use those as the, as the found, found foundational points to, uh, to make our assessments on. And I think what's an interesting takeaway here is that an average donkey trip earns society about two euros and 70 cents. Uh, and this is basically looking at reduced con uh, congestion and public health savings, right? And on top of that, then you have about 90% uh, less CO2 per kilometer on, on, uh, on a bike here compared to a regular car. Um, and I, I think it's important to, to note that, uh, as I mentioned before, how, how you go about this. So we've done it by engaging a third party, being the University of Dresden, to kind of design the methodology. So that's what questions do you ask? When do you ask them? How do you ask them? How often do you ask them? How many people do you ask? And so on to, to look at this and, and how we structure the data with across the cities. Um, so I think that it's a really nice takeaway here. And I think uh, maybe three points important to note. This is, of course, done on donkey bikes, but similar value impacts must be assumed to be done generally across bike sharing. So I think the important takeaway for cities, regions, other people here is that there's quite an immense social value benefit coming from moving people to bike sharing. And again, this was only based on, we actually had eight points we wanted to uh, measure. We only did uh, the social health outcomes here, health outcomes and the CO2 emissions and congestion. And there's even other points that also benefit, right? So I think that's an important measure. Um, then I think also when you look at this, there's the, um, this is looking at these savings is one point. So you have to look at, dig into what are the different types of vehicles you have. You have uh, regular cars, e-cars, you have scooters, you have trains, buses, all these things. And that's where we had all the data from, I mentioned before. But then you have to also look at really at the replacement. So what is each trip replacing? And uh, so that's of course part of this, but it's also interesting to note here how different it is across the operations. So. Some operations we have, it's maybe around 3% replacing car trips. Some places it's over 20%. So it really also matters how the project is structured and where it's taking place. Um, so I think as somebody who wants to engage operators to deliver bike share, you have to think about this when you're constructing your project. What is it you want to achieve uh, from these things? Um, and the last little note that I think is actually funny is... Uh, I, when when I was digging a bit more, I was just reading up again on how we got to all these numbers for, for, for the webinar. When I look at the the bike, you know, also a private bike, but also the regular shared bikes, by far the biggest part of the greenhouse gas emissions that is allocated to to those trips comes from infrastructure. So that means the bike roads that you're biking on, right? Because we do say some of that does should be allocated towards the the vehicle, but in reality, of course, I assume you will build bike roads and use them regardless of the shared bike. So even the impact of, of shared uh, pedal bikes is probably much is much lower than the numbers we use here um, when it comes to greenhouse gas emissions. Um, yeah, but and I, I'm always happy to talk about this. And uh, I think this is one of the points that really highlights how valuable bike, bike sharing is. And that's why we need more of it. Thank you, Alexander. Always uh, brilliant insights. Let's jump into the last question of this uh, block, investments. Carolyn, back to you. Um, we have a very specific question. First, how important is public funding in general with bike sharing versus public transport and the relationship? And maybe the more important question, what kind of return on investment can cities and governments expect when investing in a bike share system? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess a lot has has been said already, so I'll try to be to 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 be uh, to go a step further. So we we've seen that uh, public uh, funding is 
a matter of uh, um, of uh, revenue funding, uh, but also a matter of return on investment because if you are able to fund a, a public bike share, then it means you will be able to deploy it in a wider zone and or in uh, cities where maybe the the the, the, the awaited uh, usage won't be enough to make uh, as it as itself a revenue from the user. And I've seen a a, a lot of question in the chat um, about uh, other type of revenue like advertising. So I guess there is something in, indeed to think about diversifying the way we fund bike share. But at the moment, there are three type of funds, public funding, either from local, national, or even uh, European funds, there are user and there is advertising. Um, but um, so it's uh, public funding is a matter of um, of um, making uh, the scheme uh, um, uh, viable and making the scheme uh, more inclusive because thanks to public public funding that you'll be able to deploy in wider range or in smaller cities and you will also be able to offer uh, cheaper rates uh, so that means that in terms of type of uh, uh, public you will be able to attract people uh, that might um uh that, that that are not able to uh to pay more than what they're already paying with public transport and we have discussed that as uh, on how, how important it is to um to build these uh, uh public bike share system in coherence with uh public transport uh, because that will probably be uh, the, the most important thing in order to make it a success. So the more people you have, the more trip you have, then uh, also the more uh, kilometers by car you might uh, replace. And that's also why it's interesting to deploy those bike share outside of city centers, because that's where a car is queen. So if, and we are all here to boost cycling and bike share is um, a way for people to test cycling and probably to pass along and 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 maybe quit our scheme to become true cyclists by by buying their own bike and um but our, our main uh, point is to boost cy cycling and to decarbonate transport and this uh, will be and and uh, alexander just uh, made a very good point and we have recently made a study that uh, for for the french market that had the same uh, results the model share report is very different uh, from city center to suburbs and more or less except for very um, less dense rural area the further you go from city center the the more model share you will create from uh from car so the, that that's also all 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 this uh public funding will make uh the system more um, interesting in terms of trips, in terms of inclusivity, because of, in terms of type of people, and I mean social inclusivity, but also geographical inclusivity by by attracting to you scheme people from other uh, area, from wider areas, um, and and that results in a, a better um, um, a, a better result in decarbonization. Uh, in that French study we made with the with uh, the, the French government, we were able to attest that a bike share is able to decarbonate 187 kilos of CO2 equivalent per bike per year. So, and as uh, to to give you a mar uh, an example for the French uh, market, it's about 12. Uh, thousand tons of CO2 that we are able to take out of the atmosphere just by deploying bike share. So it really has a big effect in uh, in uh, in decarbonization, and that's important at a local level because you will be able to attract more people if your city is, is more livable. Of course, your city will also be more peaceful, and people will be in better health. That another figure that we have is uh, that coming from that that same French government is that each kilometer ridden by bike. Uh, saves about 69 cents of euros of health expenses. So we could calculate with all this, the, the, the scheme that we present here today, that we talk millions that we're saving from our health uh, expense uh, for, uh, for our government. So there is um, a big uh, a challenge in uh, 
set, in, in uh, increasing uh, public funding, but at, at, all, at all scale, but also thinking about diversifying from other ways of um, uh, of trans of um, uh, of uh, financing. And uh, an example I can give is we've just deployed a fleet in Copenhagen that is uh, uh, funded by Toyota. It's an example of it's a uh, bike share, but it's funded by a company. Uh, so there are multiple ways of uh, deploying a uh, bike share and funding bike share. Thank you, Carolyn, for the overview. Um, yes, there are indeed many different ways uh, to fund bike share. Um, now it's the time for some questions that have been coming from uh, the audience. Uh, and this is for uh, the entire panel, but uh, there are some that are more specific than others. Let's go right into it to uh, take advantage of the time that we have. Um, this question is directly for Giancarlo, but anyone else in the panel can join in whenever they see it. Fit time-wise, Giancarlo, the end of a contract of a public contract is both a huge risk and a great opportunity for even the best performing bike share. As an example, Paris. Can you provide your best pieces of advice for metropoles approaching the end of their bike share contracts? I think this is a very interesting question. Yeah, a good good question. Thank you for the question. Um, I think keeping of my theme of my first uh, answer is uh, understand what worked and what didn't work. Um, you know, regardless if you're coming out of a, a partnership uh, that, you know, you, you deemed wasn't completely successful, but there are things that work. And the, the areas that you need improvement, uh, really listen, because there's a reason why, you know, maybe it wasn't as, because if you're looking for other providers, that means, you know, obviously something went wrong. So, you know, it goes back to my first initial advice is uh, get involved, get engaged. And, you know, when, you know, community outreach is not just when you're introducing something new, uh, you know, just five years ago, e-bikes weren't even on uh, the radar, you know, it was on the radar, but it wasn't as successful as we see it today. So technology uh, changes, uh, consumer habit changes. So my advice to you is, uh, you know, not only take the negative, but take the positive uh, and, and really see if you can address uh, all the needs in your, uh, let's call it the, the relaunch of, of your, of your system. So um, yeah, that's the advice uh, I would give. Absolutely. Great. Great. I personally tend to agree with you, Giancarlo. Is there anyone else in the panel that would like to answer? what a city could do with it uh, coming to the end of a contract of a bike share contract any good advice yeah can i add something yes um it's actually also in reaction to what Car caroline said uh, how do you fund a uh, a bike sharing scheme uh, i think every city is looking at uh, how can we reach 2030 uh, targets in terms of climate change and usually that's where the bike share comes into play because the main goal of, of most cities, how do we reduce the amount of car trips? Uh, and my advice would be uh, look to, to use both a carrot and a stick. Uh, a stick is making it more difficult to, to drive a car. Uh, many cities are doing that, uh, like lowering the maximum speed. Uh, it's happening everywhere, also in Amsterdam. Uh, and the other way is to make it more attractive to use a bike sharing scheme. And that can be done by funding the bike sharing scheme, but it can also be done directly by funding uh, the users of that scheme. Uh, so we, we have some agreements with several cities where they hand out vouchers. So they buy vouchers from us and they hand those to specific targets groups that they think should be promoted uh, using uh, shared mobility. So there, there are multiple ways to, to create a carrot for inhabitants to start using the, that bike sharing scheme. Very important point, Alex. I think, uh, yeah, I think another point can be in, enough because none of these things go, I think, in all situations. But try avoid making your or make your infrastructure a kind of operator agnostic. Try 
avoid getting too tied in by infrastructure or developments based on one operator. So hopefully you'll have an operator that you like and you can continue with and so on. But as Giancarlo said, technology moves and things innovate and maybe in the next round, other people are bidding. And then you want to avoid with the limited city space you have to, to cage yourself in with however you have chosen to build your cityscape. So try to keep it open so it's easier for you to mm, leverage innovation and other operators and so on. Mm -hmm. Good point. Let's uh, take another question now that we're at it here. Um, one of the questions that has been coming up uh, the most, and that was also a subject of uh, and a whole webinar, but let's uh, just uh, pick it up again. What are the best KPIs and data requests required from a local government from bike operators? Um, I think this is a classic for Sebastian and you have your hand raised, fantastic, <laughs> just for you. Yeah, I anticipated this uh, question, yes. So KPIs and data requests should be directly connected <clears throat> to the objectives the local government wants to achieve. Also, I give you an example of an appropriate and maybe a not so appropriate KPI. So starting with the not so appropriate, if you're asking for very specific operational KPI, something like the percentage of stations without a vehicle over 24 hours, yeah, what does it really tell you? Is it an in indicator for bad operations or for heavy usage or maybe for badly chosen station? Maybe operators might intentionally leave stations empty and optimize the fleet to match supply and demand. And at the particular stations, there's simply no demand, could be. You know? So it doesn't really tell you anything. But if you are applying uh, parameters such as the number of rides per thousand population, like the indicator we've uh, defined also in our benchmark study, that can give you the efficiency of the fleet at a meta level, at a high, high level. It doesn't, uh, doesn't go into the nitty gritties of which station particularly performs how. No? Um, then also, what do you want to achieve? If you want to achieve a mode shift, a significantly evident mode shift from cars yeah then ask your riders on with a standardized user survey every year what is the percentage of which which mode of transport would they have chosen in case this bicycle wasn't available for this trip no and then you have a good indicator so um there's a publication from the oecd itf uh, called measuring new mobility it was released a couple of months ago, um, which suggests a few indicators related to different policy areas. So what we need to achieve is, I think, a broader standardization of those data indicators to make schemes more comparable. And I think this CIE benchmarking study here is also a good uh, way into the right direction, but we need to work together with the organizations like OECD, ITF, like others, OMF, mobility data, to get better and global standards for all kinds of uh, indicators. Heard, heard. Jose? Yeah, thanks. Um, perfect segue uh, to talk about data standards. Uh, I think it's really important to, that we're requesting data that is standardized and so there's an even playing field for everybody, but also it's easier for everybody. If you're a city and you're requesting data standards, there's more likelihood that you're going to find tools to help you understand what data you're receiving. Uh, so this is just my pitch to encourage people to require GBFS um, in your tenders or in your RFPs. Uh, there's also, you know, the ability to require MDS if that's something you want to do. Uh, I highly recommend requesting data standards instead of any kind of non-regulated, not regulated, but non-formalized form of data because it then, like I said, it makes everybody's lives easier. Uh, I'll include a link in the chat to a article that Mobility Data prepared on how to actually require GBFS. And it actually has copy paste language that you can use uh, to put into your uh, your tender. So there's a link that there. This is our uh, localized European one. We also have it available in English, Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Uh, but the link I've shared is English. Thank you, Jose. Speaking of, uh, the panel has been super uh, good at answering questions live. There is uh, actually more than 11 uh, questions answered in the chat box. So we are running to the end of this great webinar. I think it has been uh, yeah, very interesting to talk about different points and get a little more into detail. I'd like to finalize this webinar by just making an open call for all the attendees here 
The Bike Share Expert Group has been working a lot this entire year to be able to be heard in Europe and basically uh, make better shared services to the citizens uh, around Europe specifically. Uh, we want to make the industry better. We want to continue having these moments of echoing our experience to you. So please spread the word. We intend to continue doing so in 2024 with more events uh, and with more webinars happening, especially at Velo City as well. In Ghent, we're going to have some two workshops like we did last year in Leipzig. So please do sign up for, for the Velo City there. We will all be there, the people that were in this webinar. And apart from that, uh, appreciate uh, the interaction and see you in the next year. Thank you all.